Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Welcome back to the Nano Hub U course, Thermal Energy at the Nanoscale. I'm Tim Fisher, and uh, we're in week two, and today we're going to talk about black body emission intensity. So this is a continuation of the last lecture where, where we were talking about thermal radiation and the photon energy field. Just to remind you a little bit about that, um, we started the problem by saying what would happen or asking the question how the energy is distributed inside of a box uh, where we have a photon field. So this does not have a lattice to carry it, uh, to carry the, the energy, uh, but the photons have some restrictions on wavelength and we derived those. And then we went through uh, quite a few other steps to reach the point where we, that we're showing on the bottom here, and that's really where we left off. We developed these things, uh, these expressions for spectral energy densities or spectral specific energy, and those are the U primes. And we're, we're generally interested in a number of different possible spectra. The first one would be the energy field, that's the epsilon. Um, also, wavelengths are particularly important for uh, photon studies and, and very common. And then the bottom two are the frequencies. So that's uh, nu is the, is the regular frequency and omega is the angular frequency. That's something that we use quite a bit with phonons. The point being that we can derive from statistical mechanics and some other other uh, considerations, we can derive how the energy is dis distributed in different spaces, energy space, wavelength space, and so forth. And it all depends on temperature through the distribution function. In this case, phonon, or photons and photons, but in this case, photons obey Bose-Einstein statistics, so we call them bosons. Now what we want to do is to take these expressions for spectral energy density and turn that into an understanding of how the energy propagates. And to do that, we'll start with a thought experiment. We're, we're really interested in a radiation field that is inside the cube, but to access it, what we would say is that we're, we'll open up a very small hole on the top of the cube. So that's re represented over here where we have a, a little pinhole right there where the radiation is allowed to leave. And for photons, it's actually pretty easy. Uh, at least some parts of the problem are pretty easy because they move with the same speed in a given medium, at least with a, a given index of refraction. Um, and we will also assume that the, the energy is distributed throughout the solid angle that uh, is shown in this in this image. So a solid angle is a three-dimensional angle. If you're not familiar with it, you can look it up online. It's pretty simple. It's a pretty simple concept. But I will note that a, a hemisphere, as we're showing here, because the pinhole is only allowing things to go to move up, um, the hemisphere has two pi steradians. A steradian is the is the unit of solid angle, and we're interested to know what the emitted intensity is. Now intensity is a, a concept that often trips people up. We won't use it too much, uh, but, it, but to think of it, what it is, it's the energy flux per unit area and per unit solid angle and per unit spectral quantity, whatever spectrum we're interested in. So in other words, that could be, again, wavelength or one of the frequencies or energy. And what we need to do to understand this, this emitted intensity is we say, well, we know that the, the radiation field itself inside the box has a certain energy density to it. And then if we, can, if we can somehow understand how fast that field is moving, then we'll know the rate at which energy is leaving this hole. And that's, that's the idea for the exercise today. So we express this intensity with the variable i, and in this case we'll look specifically at the frequency, the angular frequency spectrum. We represent this intensity, as I stated before, mathematically as the product of this spectral energy density, that's u prime, and the speed with which the field is moving, and that's simply the speed of light, c. So that's the first product that we form. 
But as we said before, the, uh, the intensity by definition is per unit solid angle. Again, the solid angle is that three-dimensional angle. And we said that a hemisphere has a solid angle of 2 pi. So we're going to normalize by that. We're going to assume that it's all distributed in that 2 pi solid angle. And then the last term here that we have to deal with is the fact that there's a one half in front. And the reason is that only half of that energy density is is actually moving upward. The other half is moving downward. And so we don't count that in this spectral intensity that's coming out of this pinhole. And we can also uh, define other spectra and this is commonly done. So instead of using the angular frequency, we could use the wavelength, and that's the first expression that we're showing here. Um, we could use the, the regular frequency nu as well. We could also use energy. Um, we'll let you uh, on your own kind of play around with these different factors uh, so that you can, can establish some understanding of it. But they're all essentially the same thing. What they have is a a, a, a they have a, a term that's, in this case, for a three-dimensional problem, generally proportional to energy to the power three. And you'll see that in those frequencies in particular. And then multiplied by the distribution function. So in this case, again, that's the Bose-Einstein distribution function. Well, what does it look like? Here's a, here's a graph, and this is actually uh, what we call a black body. And you might think, well, we didn't say anything about the color of the cube. How can it be a black body? Well, the best way to make a black body is actually to create a cavity. In fact, that's how black body calibration sources are made. So the cavity itself is black. And what black means is that every, light, every element of light, every photon that comes into the object is absorbed. And, and as you might imagine, because we have a pinhole, what we mean is at that pinhole, anything that comes into it would go inside of the, the box. And so through some reciprocal relationships, that also means that the, the surface looks black um, in, in terms of the radiation field that comes out. Well, what, is this, what does this all look like? Um, we're plotting here the angular frequency spectrum. And you see that it's, uh, it, there's a fairly strong temperature dependence. We'll notice that the angular frequencies for room temperature and above, that's the main graph here, we start out at about 100 terahertz. This is for, again, this is for light. So the speed of light is important, and, and that's a factor in, in assessing where this peak exists. If we had a slower speed of light, then this would, that would shift the, the, uh, the peak. And you'll see then as we move up in, uh, temperature moving up to 500, 700, 900, we see that the angular frequency that's also proportional to the energy uh, increases at the peak point, at the peak of this graph. Eventually something gets hot enough so that you can see it glowing and at that point normally speaking that's happening somewhere uh, depending on, on your eyesight, uh, it's happening somewhere between 700 and 900 degrees Kelvin. Uh, that's where you start to see things grow, glow, uh, sort of a warmish orange color. Um, orange or, or red is the first uh, wavelength that, that your eye can see. Eventually, if we, had to much, if we went to much higher temperatures, then we'd start to see the green and the blue and so forth. If we go to very low temperatures, that's the inset of this graph, you'll notice that the temperature, the peak position, the peak frequency, I should say the frequency at which the intensity is peaked um, is shown here and it, and it generally decreases. So how does this all relate to phonons? Because that's what we've talked a lot about. We, in fact, we, we hadn't talked much to, about photons at all up to this point. And the reason we did this is that it, this, uh, this uh, Planck's radiation law is a very well-established law. It's a, it's a monumental achievement in, in physics from 100 years ago. And, uh, and so I think people can have a, tend to have more of a, of a natural intuition about it. But for phonons, <clears throat> they follow the same statistics there are a few other intricacies about phonons, and the, the biggest one is that they tend not to have a constant group velocity like light does at the speed of light. Uh, but there's some work, there's been much work over the years to, co to correlate 
or to compare phonon transport to photon transport and a lot of the tools that people had developed for photon transport can apply. In this case, I show you one from uh, quite a while ago, about 20 years ago, uh, but it, I, it's fairly instructive. Uh, in this case, theta, that's the y-axis in these graphs, is, uh, is a, a normalized temperature. And then uh, xi here is, a, uh, is just a, a dimensionless uh, position coordinate. And here we have something called the equation of phonon radiative transport. So I have an object with two sides on it, and I want to, to calculate the temperature field inside. And what we find is that in this case, uh, again, the, the conditions are described in the paper, when I have a very small range, so the two sides are very close to each other with a little bit of material in the middle, the transport becomes quasi-ballistic so that it's not entirely diffusive and, and highly scattering on the inside. And what we find is that when we use the equation of phonon radiative transport, or transfer sometimes it's called, um, we find that there's actually a temperature jump. The boundary condition on the left side says that theta equals one, and on the right side it says that theta equals zero. But we notice that on the boundaries themselves, there's actually a temperature jump. That temperature jump is a ballistic effect, and it's not captured by the usual um, the usual approach for solving heat conduction problems. So that's the Fourier, Fourier's law. In this case, it's a slightly, it's a slight variation on Fourier's law. It's a hyperbolic variation, but but nevertheless, the principle remains that in that case we have a continuous temperature field. The boundary temperature is one, and the and in the material just next to the boundary, it's also very very close to one. Whereas if we treat this more like a radiation problem, then we see that that we can actually predict a temperature jump. Now, if we move to a thicker material, and still using the scaled coordinate, so the scaled length goes from zero to one, uh, we find that for a, a 10 times thicker object, the that temperature jump predicted by this radiative transport model uh, diminishes substantially so that we reach a point where they're almost the same, where the, the, the phonon radiative transport equation is almost the same as the Fourier's law, which is the classical um, way of, of handling uh, these sorts of problems. The point being that uh, we have a, a way to, there's an analogy between photon radiation and phonon transport uh, that's important to, to understand and appreciate in these problems. In this case, it's not just, there are other compl complications because uh, really the effects that, that are uh, most prominent here are scattering, and we haven't yet talked about those. But I thought it was a good idea to bring up uh, a, an example like this to show you that phonons too can act a lot like photons do in uh, thermal radiation. That's all for today, and uh, I'll see you next time.